Johnson, and I am the owner of Alaska Photo Tracks, which is a photo tour and workshop company based in Anchorage. And I've also got my small, little small gallery here in Anchorage. And I'll just go ahead and launch into my presentation, uh, which is what I call a nocturnal obsession, which I think is an appropriate name for what it's like to get engaged in chasing and photographing the aurora borealis or northern lights everybody see my screen okay screen looks good i'm gonna everybody's muted i think and i'm gonna mute myself and we'll let you get started great um thank you so much uh and again i i really wanted to share something with you that you know not something you'd actually get to see down there in utah and uh, hopefully inspire you to go to places that are good for northern lights photography and i'm going to talk a lot about how to know how to plan a trip around the northern lights where to go when to go and then what are some good tools to help you have a successful northern lights photographic expedition so the number one thing that people often ask is what is the aurora borealis now that depends on who you ask through time you know People, humans have been seeing the Northern Lights for thousands of years, and in the Northern climates particularly, there's been built up a rather wealth of mythology and legends and stories about the Northern Lights. You know, in Viking folklore, there is, you know, reference to the Bifrost Bridge, which is a shining rainbow-colored arc across the sky that carries fallen warriors to Valhalla. When you hear that description, it seems like a lot like the Northern Lights. Or also, sometimes flashes of the the shields and the armor of the Valkyries in the sky. Now, the Valkyries were the warrior women who were at least legend, legendary warriors in Norse mythology. In Alaska, for the most part, it's considered a, a fairly benign thing. It ranges from spirits of ancestors and fallen ones to different types of animals, uh, spirits of different animals. But they also it's sometimes used to... Uh, tell lessons to children. For example, the Nunami of people in Anaktivik Pass, when it's cold out and the Northern Lights out, they tell their kids, you better wear your hat when you go outside or the Aurora will chop off your head and play with it like a ball. And I don't know how you tell your kids to dress for the cold, but I think that's kind of an interesting way of, of doing it. And there are several different references to heads and playing ball in uh, different native mythology. Sometimes walruses playing a ball or the head of a walrus as the ball. It's just really kind of an interesting mix. But we know from time, uh, and, and for the last 400 years or so, we had a better understanding scientifically of what the Northern Lights is. And it was actually Galileo who coined the term 400 years ago, Aurora Borealis, named after Aurora, the Roman goddess of the dawn. And Boreas, the northern wind, the Greek word for the northern winds. So what is the northern lights? Well, today we understand the northern lights to basically be uh, an offshoot of active sun or solar activity. And it can come from a variety of things. It could be a, a really uh, a strong, uh, what's called a coronal hole, which if you ever look at a photo of the sun or these large dark masses of the sun, that are called coronal holes, and they basically continuously stream energy out into space. And we know that these can be active for several months or even years. So these are really good for long-term forecasting because it takes about 28 days, 27 days for the sun to rotate. And as that coronal hole comes back around again, we can extrapolate that we may also have northern lights again 27, 8, 27 28 days later when that coronal hole is again geoffective, pointing towards Earth. We can also get coronal mass ejections as one term that's kind of a sudden impulse release of energy off the sun. And either way, both of these release what's called an energized plasma, which often carries the magnetic charge of the sun with it. It rides the solar winds. It hits our magnetosphere and kind of slings around to the backside of the Earth. And what happens next is a mixture of what's going on with the solar winds, how fast they are, what's going on with our magnetic field, whether or not it's got a negative or a southern polarity, and, and, we, and whether or not we get these, what they call cracks in our magnetic field that allow this energy to come through and interact with our atmosphere. Long story short, that's what causes the Northern Lights. 
Now, the colors of the aurora are basically what happens when this energized plasma interacts with either oxygen or nitrogen in our atmosphere. So green is the most commonly seen color of the northern lights. And that is the energized plasma interacting with oxygen up to about 150 kilometers, and then above that, interacting with red. Or correction, interact, it, red is what's caused of, at higher altitudes when interacting with oxygen. On the flip side, when you have interacting with nitrogen, you'll get blue at lower altitudes up to about 60 kilometers, and then purple above that. But as you can see, there's a whole spectrum of colors that we get when this plasma interacts with either oxygen or nitrogen in the atmosphere. Now, on a really good storm, you're going to get all of these colors. Now, one of the things that makes photographing the northern lights a really valuable part of experiencing the phenomena is that for the most part, a lot of these colors are just not visible to the naked eye. They are only going to show up in the camera. And that's because specifically of the long exposure of the camera. And I, I'd always thought it was the higher ISO sensitivity of this camera sensor. Um, but this winter, I really confirmed that it was that longer exposure that does it because it was a really active night around March 19th, I was up in the Brooks Range, which is our northernmost mountain range, and I was shooting simultaneously video on two different cameras, a Sony Alpha 7S and a Nikon Z62. And I was shooting video with those and then also doing long exposures with my Nikon Z850. And the video was not picking up the colors that the long exposures were in the still camera. Now, this is simply because the, the rods in our eyes that send data to the brain that is interpreted as color don't perceive color very well in dark conditions. So the aurora has to be really bright in order to see the colors. I have in this picture here, for example, this red was visible to the naked eye, but it was a really active storm and it was a really bright aurora, which allowed my eyes to perceive the color. So I was seeing the red and the green, but not the yellow and not the purple. And there's a lot of different shapes and kind of formations that the aurora borealis causes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those and kind of what they represent in the different stages of an aurora event. Now, first we have what are called arcs. Uh, people also refer to these as bands. This is essentially the initial appearance of the aurora most commonly. At low on the horizon, you'll see this low, wide arc. And it'll first appear in the naked eye as either a pale gray or white. But as it gets brighter, you'll actually start to see the green with the naked eye. And as the aurora gets more active, that'll start to get higher in the sky. It'll get whiter. It'll get brighter. And then you'll start to see density changing in the arc as it starts to get active. Now, sometimes those arcs may then split off and become other formations. The next one I'll talk about is called a band. Now, these can be either be really sharply defined, or they can also be very diffuse and kind of spread out, but it's a very distinct pattern in the aurora. <coughs> These are typically found in more active aurora conditions. <coughs> Pardon my cough. And they can move either really slowly and they can stay static in the same position for a while, or sometimes move with some moderate speed. So you have to adjust your shutter speed accordingly. The next type of formation we'll see, and again, these can also sometimes come off of an arc that has kind of split off and become more active. And these are called pillars. Uh, aurora chasers will refer to them as spikes. Uh, it's, I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but aurora chasers just seem to feel like they need to make up names that scientists don't use. And in this case, these are pillars. These are a really active, interesting, vibrant aurora typically. They can range in height up to about 100 kilometers and their width, their thickness, it can be about a kilometer, just kind of give you a sense of scale of what you're looking at. Next, uh, one of the most kind of coveted types of aurora formations to see is what's called a corona. This is when you're looking straight up at the zenith of the aurora. So imagine uh, earlier some of those other formations being off in the distance in front of you. Now the aurora is directly overhead this is the byproduct of a very active storm level display. It is always multicolored and you know, particularly really vibrant pinks and purples along with the green. It's also typically very active. So you need to adjust your shutter speed and your ISO accordingly 
And I'll talk a little bit about some of the typical settings that we'll use for photographing the Northern Lights. And the corona, there's, there are ways to photograph it, even when it's more or less directly overhead, with a really wide angle lens to help include some kind of foreground element so you can see some part of the landscape as well as the corona itself. And it comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Quite frequently, I see coronas taking on the appearance of what looks like birds, which is always kind of interesting. But aurora chasing can a lot of times be like, you know, looking at clouds, imagining what, what, what is, oh, what is that? That looks like the shape of an elephant. Now I see a giraffe, you know, whatever. Um, a lot of people do that with Northern, right? Northern Lights displays. And then last we have what's called a pulsating aurora. It's a certain type of aurora that appears as patches of flickering brightness of the aurora, kind of flashing here, flashing there, just kind of pulsating all over the place. It's really challenging to cap capture in a still image to get the effect. The best way to do to get the effect is doing time lapse, because then you can see the flashing and the pulsating back and forth in the sky. But they're basically caused by what are called chorus waves, or when shifts in the current of charged particles cause electrons to scatter across the atmosphere. So it's a really interesting effect. I often see it typically in the later part of an aurora storm, like well into like two, three, or even four in the morning. And then there's Steve. Now, Steve is not actually an aurora borealis, but he's often seen with the aurora, so we like to talk about him when talking about the Northern Lights. So what is Steve, or who is Steve, you might ask? Um, <clears throat> so when aurora chasers first started seeing this phenomenon, which occurs, it's, it's separate from the aurora, might have a diffuse aurora going on to the north, clearly the north, but then there's this pale line that goes straight from east to west overhead across the sky. You might see a little bit of pink with the naked eye, but the pink really shows up well in the camera. So when aurora chasers saw this, they're like, oh, let's call it something. We're gonna call it a proton arc. And scientists are like, no, 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 no. Protons aren't visible to the naked eye, so it can't be something derived of protons. All right, so some aurora chasers in Canada are like, fine, we have to name it something, so we're gonna call it Steve. And again, scientists are like, no, 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 no. Don't make up names for stuff. So in studying the phenomenon, they determined that it kicks out a lot of heat. It's very hot. So they came up with a name to reflect what research had shown, and they named it a strong thermal emission velocity enhancement. Yes, you got it. They named it Steve. Uh, but Steve, typically, I see around the spring and the fall. I have never seen it in the middle of the winter. And again, it's usually associated with a pretty active aurora display. And as you can see in this photo, the main aurora display has kind of gotten more diffused and settled, and that's when Steve kicks in. All right, so when can you see the aurora? There's kind of big picture when and small picture when, and when are the best times to see it. So the sun is the sun is the driving force behind the northern lights. So we also look to what's going on with the sun to determine when is the best time to see the northern lights. The sun goes through a roughly 11 year cycle, starting with what's called solar minimum, going up to solar maximum and back down to solar minimum again. Now it's not like clockwork, it's not exactly 11 years every time, it varies. But the two things they look at to trigger whether or not we're at a new solar minimum and thus a new solar cycle are one, the sunspot activity. How long has it been since the last sunspot? I think with our last solar minimum, we went through like 290 days without a sunspot. And the other thing they look for is the sun actually shifts its polarity. And those two things together trigger the beginning of a new solar cycle. So over time, the sun has gone through, we've been tracking actual solar maximum and solar minimum periods for going on for 400 years. And as you can see from 1600 to 1700, there wasn't a lot of activity at all. That was kind of during the sort of mini ice age period. And since then, we've been seeing a lot of activity. And you notice, even with the solar maximums, the solar maximums, some maximums have highs and lows. You see the late 1700s, it gets really high, early 1800s, it's low, mid 1800s high, low 19s, and so on and so forth. And so we have both maximum and minimum for 
the maximums over the big picture. This was our, our last three solar cycles. If you talk to people who live in Alaska in the late 1980s, they talk about a war that's like filling the entire sky with red. So you can see that that was a really high period of activity around the late 1980s, particularly 1988. And you see that our solar maximums have kind of gone down since then. Although even as even with the, the two solar maximums ago, there were reports of people seeing low aurora on the horizon in northern Georgia. This is where we're at now. We're in solar cycle 25. So our last solar minimum was in December of 2019. So now we're on the upswing towards our next solar maximum with the estimate, which will be around July of 2025. So if you really want to make sure to get the absolute best aurora, the time, the years leading up to and at solar maximum are a great time to plan aurora travel. But there are also other factors that play into when it's a good time to see the northern lights. So one of the things that scientists have determined over a, there was a 75 year study of aurora activity that concluded the most active periods for aurora borealis activity were around the fall and spring equinox. And specifically March being the busiest month followed by September and then bordering months of uh, February, April and August, October. Now what they determine is, I mentioned earlier that we need to have these cracks in the magnetic field that allow the energy to come through to create more active displays. Well, those cracks occur with much greater frequency around the fall and spring equinox compared to any other times of the year. The catch is they don't know why they occur more frequently then, they just know that's what's driving the increased aurora borealis activity around the fall and spring equinox. So, there are other times of year though where you can see the Northern Lights. I mean, I have photographed the Northern Lights in December, which is considered the lowest month for aurora activity. Um, it's just not happening as frequently. It's, not, it's not, not a time of year that I would plan a trip to go see the Northern Lights, either in December or January. I wouldn't because those are really low periods. But like with anything, you know, you can still get them. You just have to wait around a long time. Another factor is how far north you're going and how bright the days are, how long the days are. So in Alaska, uh, I've said I photograph the northern lights in all times of year, except for two months. I've never photographed the northern lights in June or July. And that's simply because the areas where you're going to see the northern lights most frequently are also so far north that in June and July, you won't see a single star in the sky other than the sun. That's it. Right now, we're really pushing the envelope for aurora viewing. I've photographed it as late as May 14th, which is when this photo was taken. But this was also a really strong active aurora display. The twilight gets so bright that you really need a strong display in order to see it. As a photographer, uh, I also prefer to have a little bit of moon in the sky. A lot of people will say that the best time to go see the Northern Lights is around a new moon. If you just want to see them and not photograph them, I could agree with that. But as a photographer, Northern Lights photography is still landscape photography. You want to still think about what's a good composition, what's going to be an interesting photo. And for me, the moon really matters because some moonlight helps to illuminate the landscape so you can see its details. Otherwise, everything is just a black silhouette. It's not as interesting. So I like to have a little moon. I'd say up to about 50% illumination is good. After that, you start to get moon that's bright enough to where it starts to interfere with your ability to see more mild northern lights display. All right, but really, really, when specifically can I see the northern lights? Uh, you may wonder. The big picture, solar maximum, sure, fall and spring equinox. But how will I know when I'm going someplace if I can see it? Well, fortunately, there are a lot of tools that are available. I spoke to uh, a longtime Aurora chaser a few years ago, and he'd been photographing the Northern Lights for about 30 years. And before there were all these tools we have now, he said, basically, if you had a really good show, just mark your calendar 28 days in the future, make sure you're out again. Again, that's that if there's an active Corona Hall, you, you can get lucky with that. But now there's a lot of different tools, and I'm going to kind of highlight some of them and kind of talk about some of their positives and negatives. Now, one that most people think of when they Google Aurora forecasts in Alaska, they find the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute Aurora forecast. 
it's very user friendly visually. It kind of spells things out very plainly, but it has a few problems. One, it relies too much. It relies actually exclusively on what the KP index is for its forecast. And I'm gonna explain what that is. Two, it also doesn't convert the forecast to Alaska time. It's getting a feed directly from the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center, which is in universal time. <laughs> so Greenwich Mean Time. For Alaska, that's an eight hour time difference. So when they're showing a display like this, and they're saying it's gonna be, it's gonna be a KP2 for Alaska, it doesn't tell you what time of day that's gonna occur. Another problem is they also don't update their forecast frequently enough with any sudden changes in geomagnetic activity. So I always like to start with the source. I mentioned it. So this is the National Oceanograph Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Space Weather Prediction Center website. This is a go-to place to not only get forecasting information, but to understand the science, understand what all these terms are that they're using, what they mean, and you can also, at the very bottom of their page, in addition to the forecasts, you see over on the right-hand side under dashboards, you've got media and resources and then subscribe. You can subscribe to a free email forecast that gets in your inbox three times daily of the three-day forecast of what's going on in the next three days with the Northern Lights. So, it's free, unlike a lot of other services you can sign up for where you actually have to pay for it. You can not only sign up for a forecast, but you can also sign up when geomagnetic, geomagnetic activity is reaching a certain level. And you'll get free email notices of that as well. Now, what the forecast looks like when it comes in, here's a three-day forecast. They break it down into three-hour time increments. And the numbers there are what is called the planetary K index or KP index. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. So there are also tons of apps out there. Um, there's one app called Space Weather Live, which is just to get live feed real-time data. This is a screenshot of what's called Meyer Work Aurora Forecast. It's both a, a free version of this and a paid version. So you've got, this is kind of the opening display of the app, and then you can tab on forecast to get what is the next 30-minute forecast, the forecast for that evening, and then the forecast for the next three days and the next 27 days. Now, it's great. It brings a lot of information in, in one spot, but also it has problems. It'll, like here in Alaska, we're not getting, it's not getting dark enough to see the aurora until 11, you know, about 11 p.m. right now. But at 6 p.m., I might get a note saying, if skies are clear, you should be able to see the aurora in one hour. No, I won't. <laughs> There've also been times when I've been out and it's saying the Aurora is a lot more active than it really is. So you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. The other thing you want to look at when you're going to head out on a particular evening to go photograph the Northern Lights is what's the cloud cover? So wherever you're at, if it's in the United States, you can go to the National Weather Service and look at radar, uh, look at satellite imagery for cloud cover in your area, or you can go more modern and go with an app the absolute best app out there is called the Windy app. It's what local pilots rely on in order to do their planning for flying. There's both a mobile and a desktop computer version of this app. So it's an excellent tool. There are three different cloud models they rely on. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail on what they are, but the way I determine which one is most active or correction accurate on a given day is I'll compare the different cloud models with actual live camera feed of what's going on at those, those locations to see what the cloud cover looks like. One website I'll also pull up on my smartphone, again, if I feel like going the website route instead of an app, is spaceweather.com. On the left-hand side of this page, as you scroll down, first on the top, this is all real-time data on the left-hand side. So on the top, it has solar wind. If you scroll down, you'll see the planetary K index as well as what's going on in the interplanetary magnetic field. When we're looking at these numbers for here for solar winds, we like to see solar winds that are faster. Solar winds that are up in the 500 to 600 kilometer per second range indicate storm level activity, really active aurora. 
down here on the very bottom, the interplanetary magnetic field. And you'll see this on any app too that talks about the magnetic field. Right under that, you'll see a B total and a number 3.1 NT, and then a BZ 1.1 NT north. So the B total or the BT indicates the power of the aurora. You want a definitely higher number than that, something in the nine or 10 range. And then for the interplanetary magnetic field, you want a BZ or a polarity that's south because think of two magnets, a uh, positive and a negative will attract. For the northern hemisphere, we want the polarity of the magnetic field to be southern in order to draw in and create more active displays. And then there is this thing, which if you click on here, it opens up to this. This graphic appears in most Aurora apps and websites. This again is direct feed from the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. This is a short term, 30 minute predictive model on the percentage or likelihood of seeing the aurora at your location. You can see there's a color legend on the bottom that the shade of the color of the arc of the aurora reflects the percentage of likelihood of seeing it in those areas. The other thing we look for up here on the top right hand corner, there's a term called hemispheric power. Right there it says 9.40 GW. So that's really low. If Even if I were in the areas that were in the deep part of this green, I probably would not be seeing the northern lights right now. We like to see that around 20 or higher in order to get a likelihood of seeing the northern lights. Okay, so where are good places to go see the aurora? And I promised a couple times I'll bring it back and tell you about what the significance of the KP or the planetary K index is. So back to that screenshot of the NOAA three-day Space Weather Prediction Center forecast. These numbers are the KP index, which goes from zero to nine. So here are some reflections, uh, examples of what those numbers mean. So the KP index essentially means, it gives you an indication of how south, far south, the aurora might be visible. The KP does not guarantee you will see the northern lights at these locations. What matters the most is how high the solar wind speeds are and what that hemispheric power is doing and what the magnetic field is doing. Those are things that cannot be predicted. They happen spontaneously. They change routinely throughout the night. But if you see an indicator, like on the far right, that KP5, that aurora might be visible down in the Seattle area and also parts of you know northern North Dakota, when you see a, a G1 or a KP5, that's usually a good indication that if you're one of the northern states, you might get a chance to see something. Here's a kind of a broader overview. The red line on the bottom is a KP9. That's the maximum level. KP7, you're running right through in between South Dakota and Nebraska, right through Iowa, northern Wyoming, and you know, middle of Idaho, you know, KP9. Your direct that's is directly overhead aurora too by the way so there was to be aurora directly overhead northern utah if you had a kp9 i have not seen a kp9 i really first started getting into chasing the northern lights about 10 years ago i have not yet seen a kp9 i've seen kp8 a couple of times but i've never seen a kp9 and that's just because the the last solar maximum was less intense than previous ones i'll bet on that graph if you remember how high that solar maximum was back in the late 1980s. Guarantee there were some KP9s during that. So in Alaska, I photographed it pretty much all over the state. Uh, this is the far northeastern corner of Alaska, a native village called Kaktovik. It is on the flat part of the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. My absolute favorite place to photograph it in Alaska is in the central Brooks Range, which is our northernmost mountain range. It's entirely above the Arctic Circle. It's easily accessible via the car. You can drive there from Fairbanks. And there are places to stay uh, in towns called Coldfoot and Wiseman. They're great places to base camp and have a little bit of a Northern Lights expedition. Four and a half hours north of Anchorage is the entrance to Denali National Park. And in low snow winters, you can drive in about 13 miles into the park. That's a great place to go photograph it. I've also photographed it there in late August while camping at one of the campgrounds that are open during the regular season. So this is about an hour and a half north of Anchorage in the Talkeetna Mountains, an area called Hatcher Pass. So this is much more close to home, easier to get to. I 
Well, I've done Denali and back a night a couple times. That's a nine hour round trip. So I only do that when the conditions are very certain to be active and also not clear around Anchorage. So Talkeetna Mountains is a great place to go to get really nice mountain landscapes with a good aurora. Then we have several rivers that are near Anchorage. This is the Knick River just east of Anchorage. It's a short drive, half an hour to get to this location to be able to see the Northern Lights, photograph them. I have photographed them in the city. This is actually the lights there you see on the, the mountain. This is the kind of the general area of town where I live in. This is called the, the hillside part of Anchorage. And this is in August. And that's actually directly over my house. This was a, a nine hour night of photographing Aurora. I was getting home about 6.30 in the morning. This was January too. And I saw you over the house and I was like, okay, one more shot before I go to bed. Then this is out on looking west of Anchorage on Albert Cook Inlet. And you can head south of Anchorage. We have this beautiful scenic drive south of Anchorage along a body of water called the Turning an Arm. It's almost like a fjord, except the water isn't deep enough. So imagine a fjord and that kind of scenery and Northern Lights, great place to go. But Speaking of fjords, I have photographed them also in Scandinavia. Uh, here is a shot of the south coast of Iceland. It's one of the fjords in the Finnmark region of Norway. I was there photographing their long distance dog mushing race, the race, the Finnmark Slopa. And then uh, also on a dog mushing trip in Sweden in the Lapland region. Here's a, a capture from Sweden. Now, a lot of people ask me, uh, do the Northern Lights look different in Norway or Iceland compared to Alaska? They don't. I've never really seen any difference. What matters the most is what side of the planet is dark when a geomagnetic storm hits. When the storm hits, that's when you get a really spectacular display. So whoever gets lucky to get that flip of the coin, that's where you're going to get some really stunning images. Okay, so a lot of stuff thrown at you on how to chase the Northern Lights. Now, since we're a camera club, let's talk about what we do to photograph the Northern Lights. So, lenses. Um, lenses do matter. Have you ever done any astro astrophotography, other types of nighttime photography? You know how important a really wide aperture is. Now, you might think, well, if I go with a, a 20 millimeter prime lens, I can get an F2. 0 aperture and then and, and yeah that would be great but the aurora changes its shape and size quite a bit in a night so it's very helpful to have zoom lenses i use uh both a nikkor 20 24 to 70 f2.8 and the 14 to 24 f2.8 for my aurora photography when the aurora starts out lower in the sky i'm in my 24 to 70 but if it gets bigger like it is in this photo it gets higher in the sky and then that's when i switch lenses to my 14 to 24. The greatest challenge that most people have in photographing Northern Lights is focus. You have to focus at true infinity, which in many cases is not where the dash lines up with the middle of your infinity symbol. Every single lens I have, that's not true infinity. That's not where the, the stars and the edges of the mountain ridges are sharp. So you have to play around a little bit, do a test shot first, lined up on infinity, take a look, zoom in on the image on your display. If it's a little fuzzy, then just move it off a little bit in one direction. If it improves, then you're going in the right direction. Now, if the moon is out, this is another thing that's really handy to have the moon. You can put your, put on autofocus, put your focus point on the moon, focus it, and then now switch to manual focus. You've, you've identified where your infinity focus is without having to fiddle around. And if you, if you pack it, uh, well, a gaffer's tape is good to have in your camera bag because now once you've set what your infinity point is, Put a strip of gaffer's tape over your focus ring so that it won't move as you put your camera away and shift from one location to the next. Protecting your lens is very important. Uh, in the middle of the winter, a lot of the places where I'm going to photograph might be near water sources. Even if they're a frozen river or a frozen lake or pond, there's still moisture in the air. So I have to keep an eye out for frost buildup on the front of my lens. Got to make sure too that if I'm taking my camera into a warm space, like if I've rented some cabin in the mountains or if I'm going into my car with the engine running, I don't want to take my camera straight into that warm environment or else I'll instantly get condensation all over my lens and my camera body. So what I typically do 
is I'll take my camera and the lens attached. I'll put it inside my camera bag, zip it up, seal it, and then now bring it into the car. The camera bag acts as a nice insulator to help for a much slower transition to that warmer temperature. Lastly, if you're the kind of person who likes to have a UV filter on your lens to protect it, you have to take it off for Northern Lights photography. Otherwise, you'll get what are called Newton's rings in the middle of the image, which are basically concentric circles that are of the same color of the aurora. And it's caused by light bouncing back and forth between the flat element of the filter and the concave elements in your lens. So keeping the camera working, um, I always leave my camera out in the cold. If I'm gonna go inside and wait in my car and warm up or whatever, wait for something to happen, if I'm staying in that location for a while, I just keep my camera out there. I, I tape along, take along a uh, like a uh, hand towel to drape over the camera to prevent any moisture buildup on the camera. I'm gonna pull my battery out and take it in with me so it stays warm. And again, if you need to bring it in, put it in your camera bag so you don't get any condensation buildup. And what's gonna happen is also when I'm out around for a while, if I'm planning on hiking away from the car for a bit, and maybe I'm not taking my whole camera bag with me. I'm going to take a couple of extra batteries with, put them in a little uh, sandwich size Ziploc, tuck them in an inner layer of my clothing so those will stay warm. So as I'm out, if my battery drains, I can just pull that cold battery out, replace it with a warm battery. And when I heat up that cold battery, it's going to restore some of that charge. But, you know, I, this depends on what kind of camera you have. You know, uh, I'm a Nikon shooter. I have a D850. I've gone two, two and a half nights without having to change a battery, change the northern lights. But when I'm shooting video with my Sony Alpha 7S II, I have to change battery about every 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> they can't handle the cold very well. Okay, settings. So <clears throat> Aurora photography is very adaptive. You, you have to have a starting point, but you also then have to be ready to adjust your settings based on the conditions. So these are my static go-to starting settings. To start with auto white balance. As I mentioned, you have to manually focus because autofocus just doesn't work at night. There's not enough contrast. Start at ISO 1600. And then I might start either an eight or 15 second exposure. That depends on how bright the moon is. If the moon is down or if it's a new moon, I'm starting at 15 seconds. But if the moon is up and the landscape is illuminated a little bit, I might start at eight. And then I'm going to check my histogram, look at the exposure, and then adjust accordingly. F2.8, if you've got it, or whatever your widest aperture setting is. If you are uh, if you have an F4 lens, you may adjust, may need to adjust your exposure time accordingly. RAW is very important for processing. Northern Lights photos, just like any other photo, it's gonna recover a lot of data. That's really crucial with making those images look good for display. Uh, I also like to engage the high ISO noise reduction, although that's just kind of a habit thing. I've not really found that it really makes a lot of difference. I still do most of my noise reduction through processing Lightroom. One thing to make sure is most cameras will default to long exposure noise reduction. Turn that off. Because what long exposure noise reduction does is it'll, it'll process the file for the equal time of the exposure. So if you have a 15 second exposure, it's gonna process that file for 15 seconds before you can take your next picture. I've also found that not to be particularly useful, particularly if you're using uh, your Lightroom or Photoshop to process your files, because it only it only makes a difference. Um, I, I've never seen it make a difference actually at all. Okay, uh, level and stability. Again, long exposures and tripods. It's key to be as stable as possible. So good sturdy tripod. I. Uh, Nikon cameras uh, have, the newer ones have what's called a virtual level or a virtual bubble. If you have that in your display, it's really important to use it because one of the hardest things to do other than focus for nighttime photography is to actually get a level horizon. It's really hard to see where that horizon is sometimes. If you don't have that in your camera, then maybe you have a tripod that's got the little bubble in it so you can use that to make sure that you have as level of a horizon as you can. If you are still using a DSLR, you want to engage your mirror lockup. Again, that helps to minimize vibration during a long exposure, and then use a cable release, remote trigger, 
or some newer cameras can also pair with a smartphone using an app and you can use that to control. If you don't have any of those things, share cable release camera app, then still use your, your self timer. That'll at least allow you to push the button, the shutter button, and then take your hands off the camera so that you're not engaging, you're not touching the camera while you're taking a picture. So one of the challenges too, um, if you wanna kind of take your Aurora photography up to the next notch, is to improve how you do your reflections. Reflections are a really great way to capture great Aurora images. And it's one of the things that I also think kind of sets the South Central part of Alaska apart from Fairbanks. Uh, Fairbanks, you can always tell Aurora pictures because Aurora photos are always trees in the foreground and Aurora, and that's it. That's because the landscape within about a two hour drive in Fairbanks is rolling hills and trees, and that's it. And in the wintertime, everything's frozen solid. There's no open water of any kind. Around Anchorage, we have coastal landscapes, we have rivers and streams that are open in the wintertime, and mountains. So it's a lot more interesting. So well, one of the things that will happen, though, if you take a picture, and do this with a sunset shot, too. If you're taking a picture of a sunset, you'll see with a reflection, see the sky is always about one stop brighter than the reflected surface of that reflection, whatever it is, whether it's a sunset or the aurora borealis. So if you have them, one easy way around this is just put on a graduated neutral density filter to knock down the sky in order to balance out the exposure, just like we do in high dynamic range situations with daytime landscape photography. But not everybody thinks to take a GND filter with them when they're doing Northern Lights photography. So my cheat that I've found for this, it works really well. Of course, most often I'm wearing you know black gloves when I'm out photographing the aurora because it's cold enough for that. When I determine what the exposure is I need to expose the sky correctly, let's say it's eight seconds, I'm going to double that exposure. I'm going to set my exposure now at 15 seconds. And before I click the button on my shutter cable, I'm going to bring my, I'm going to look through my viewfinder. I'm going to bring my hand down in front of the lens so it's blocking the sky all the way down to the darkest part of the horizon. Once I have my hand lined up, I'm going to click the shutter. I'm going to count out those eight seconds to make that half of the exposure. So let's say seven seconds, because we need eight seconds for the sky. I'm going to count out seven seconds. And when I get to 7,000, 1,000, 2,000, I'm going to get to 7, 1,000. I'm going to take my hand away. And for the last eight seconds, now the camera is exposing for the sky. So it exposes in one frame. Eight seconds for the sky and 15 seconds for the foreground. You now have a balanced exposure between the sky and the reflection. And remember again, the Royal Borealis photography is still landscape photography. Spend some time when you get to a location looking around, looking at the landscape, seeing what are the cool features about it that you find interesting, kind of pre visualize how you would photograph the aurora if it were on this spot or if it were on that spot. Think about your elements of design. Do we have leading lines? Is there a way to use rule of thirds here? Uh, is there some kind of um, uh, texture I could capture with the Northern Lights? Think about all of those because it's really easy to get caught up in just photographing the aurora because it's so awesome and you're really digging it to forget just the basic elements of good landscape photography. And that also means too, Make sure to get out of landscape or horizontal mode and flip to portrait or vertical mode. Uh, this is the only one I have in this presentation just because horizontal or landscape goes much better in a slideshow than vertical does. But it's important to remember to get out of that easy normal mode of landscape orientation and to go to portrait orientation. One of the things, if you don't have one already, if you're a landscape photographer, it's really great to have that makes this so much easier is to have an L bracket for your body so you can flip your camera so that it's still directly over the axis of your tripod and not flipping your camera over like by panning, like tilting it your, uh, up off your, your ball head or whatever like that. Because once you go off the center of the axis, you lose some stability. And if you're going on a trip to see the Northern Lights, look at the forecast during the time you might be in flight. In fact, make sure you've got a window seat. You always want to plan for a rotor photos wherever you might get them. So as you may tell, if you don't know airline logos very well, this is Iceland Air. This is actually on a flight 
from Iceland back home. And I knew the Aurora was going to be out, so I had my camera ready to go. A little challenging, though, to do this shot because there's a lot of reflective lights in a plane cabin. They're all wanting to glare off of the window. So I actually pulled my big coat down, and I used it as a blind and covered it over the window and then pressed my lens against the glass to get the picture without any glare. All right, so that's the gist of my presentation, and I am happy to answer any questions that people have. If Hopefully you remembered what you were asked from 40 slides ago. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Carl. Actually, we had a few questions typed into the chat. Okay, you, okay. Went, you went over. I have not been I've not been looking at the chat. Okay, I have been. <laughs> so that's okay. We're gonna cover them now. And I think actually you covered a lot of them. What are the typical camera okay. settings? We went through all of that. And are the photos with the mountains compositions or light painted, or is it bright enough for a single photo? I have I well. I, I don't have any light painting in any of the photos that you saw here. I think um, your conversation about the moon yes. covered that. Yeah, fact. so you, you definitely want to have now, um, I'll go back, I'll go back real, real quick again. To show you this one, this one um, shot. Oh, I took it out, bummer. Um, well, here's a good example, though. I mean, this this is what your mountains are going to look like when there's no moon in the sky. Okay. They're just black. Okay. They don't have any detail at all. And, you know, sometimes that could be cool, you know, from a graphic design perspective, if you have really cool mountain shapes. You know, the same reason why we love those shots of Joshua Trees at dusk or dawn and Joshua Tree National Park. Um, but, you know, if you want to get this, you've got to have some moonlight in the, in the sky. Now, there are times occasionally, this has happened, I've seen this, where... Um, so this one here, there was no moon in the sky here. The aurora was just so bright, it was lighting it up. Now, the key here is it has to be at a time of year when there's snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, because then that snow will reflect whatever the color of the light is in the sky. So I've got lots of pictures of snow-covered landscapes that the snow is green. That's the color of the aurora. So a really bright aurora with no moon. A lot of snow on the ground. You can see this, but if it's you know here was directly above the landscape. If it's behind it, that changes the dynamic a bit. So when you process one of those pictures that has the green snow, what do you do about adjusting white balance? Do you leave? You, it looks like you leave it green because that's what I do. You're seeing. Okay. Yeah, and, and I I actually got into uh, a, a disagreement with somebody on Facebook. It was a friend. <laughs> about a photo where I had green snow. And he's like, your white balance is off. I'm like, no, it's not. That's how it looks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There should be white snow. No, it's not. Snow in, in a, a shaded condition, a white surface will reflect the color of the sky. Yeah. I've got this one picture I took in Zion, actually, when I was hiking my way up to Angel's Landing. It's this white tree with this, the, the bark had been stripped. So there's just this bone white tree. It's in the shade, but it's a blue sunny day. So I took a picture. The bark is blue. And if you look at uh, pictures like from White Sands, you know, National Park, where you've got the low angle of light, the shadow in those white sands is going to be the color of whatever the sky is at the time. Yeah. Okay. So. You know, there, there are some things you have to do in order to make it a compelling image. But I also like to, as much as possible, preserve the interesting optical effects that are going on naturally. Then there was also a question about how you handle the serious wide angle distortions. Do you adjust in post-processing? Do you just live with it? Well, you know, for the most part, the landscapes you're photographing when you're using those lenses are far away. So usually as those distortions are gonna occur when you have something really close. Now, if I'm really close to a line of trees, yeah, I'm gonna get that distortion. Those trees are all gonna lean inwards towards the middle. Uh, there's really only so much you can do 
with some of the distortion correction in Lightroom without losing a bunch of your frame. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll adjust it a little bit. I'll first, I'll just always click the profile lens correction feature in Lightroom to see how much it adjusts. And for the most part, I'm gonna be happy with that. I wanted to know how cold it is in January. Um, it really varies. I mean, just five years ago, we at Anchorage saw its first ever calendar year with no temperature below zero. In fact, in that January, my wife and I were out skiing and it was a 37 degree sunny day and we encountered two mosquitoes. Normally, uh, temps, the coldest temps around Anchorage will be in the minus single digits uh, for lows. Once you get away from the coast, uh, about an hour away, away from the coast from Anchorage, then you can start getting into the minus 30s okay. in some areas. That was all the questions in the chat. So I'm going to open it up to the floor. And if anybody has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. And Lynn Balmer is yeah. dying to ask questions. I our international one... friend from Canada. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Carl. It was a great presentation. Uh, this may sound like a dumb question, but I'm wondering, is there a, a, an area of a, a latitude, a time of the year and circumstances under which it's technically possible to get both the Aurora and the Milky Way in one shot? Yes. Uh, in the Anchorage area in April and August, you can do that. Um, hmm. In fact, uh, let, me, let me find one real quick and I can pull it up on the screen and show it to you. Um, because, yeah, because for, for the most part in, in the lower 48, what, what we, we call guys in the contiguous United States, you know, summer is the best season for Milky Way. So we're not going to see it here in Alaska because it's too bright. But we can see it uh, in April and August because that's kind of April's when the season's kind of starting for Milky Way and August is kind of late in the season. There also, I've also photographed pretty good Aurora and uh, Milky Way in February, oddly enough. But most consistently, it's in um, April and August. So I'm just looking for this August photo right now. Uh, well, this is, this is not my, my favorite one but I'll just screen share this one particular image of the Aurora and Milky Way. And yeah, this is taken in August. Um, all right. I can't wait. To get there we go. Milky oh, Way and Aurora. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's fun too, because it's different, because it, sometimes it's, a much steeper angle like this, but other times it's much more parallel to the horizon. So it's fun to play around with the different, whether you're April and August on, you know, which, uh, which is, uh, you know, you have different options that are available. That was very cool. Yeah, that's great. Thank so you. how do you do that? Is, are, when you're shooting the, the Aurora, aren't you like pointing north? Or does um, it all around you? Well, um, so... Here's the other catch too for doing Milky Way and Aurora photos is, you know, we know that we need to have a much longer exposure to bring in all the details of the Milky Way, which also means you need to have kind of a quiet Aurora to do that really long exposure. Uh, here's the photo I was actually looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share this real quick and talk about this. So, um, that's one of the key factors. Now this is actually looking, this is looking Northeast here. So the, depending on the orientation of Milky Way, sometimes we definitely can get it. That, that previous photo I showed you is looking more Southwest, but uh, here's looking Northeast. This is in April. And, but again, you need to have a really quiet, mild aurora display that's just low on the horizon, very diffuse, not active to do a really long, this is a 30 second exposure with my 14 millimeter. So that's kind of crucial to get the, both the Milky Way and the Aurora combination. 
That is spectacular. That's that's great. I, I'm really glad you, you threw that in there. I wasn't. I as I say at the, at the outset, I wasn't even sure if it was technically possible or whether we were. You're trying to shoot shoot a moonshot in the middle of the day or something like that, you know. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. Very, very cool. So, Carl, tell us a little bit about your photo expeditions. Okay, I'm sure. like, I'm all geeked up now. It's like, okay, let's take a road <laughs> trip to see Milky Way, but or not Mil or see Aurora, but I don't know. Well we have a, a tour that's available every day. It's called our Anchorage Aurora Quest Tour. It's just an Anchorage-based tour. It's a six-hour tour, and it runs from August 7th to May 7th. So you can come in Anchorage, plan a trip, and then we have, you can either just go with us one night, or we also have a four-night pass. We can go out for four nights for basically the price of just about two, two nights bought separately. Okay. And people who have taken our four night pass have a 100% success rate. They will see the Northern Lights at least one night during that time. And, uh, but we also do workshops. We have a workshop we do every year in late August. The starting point for that is Fairbanks. So we do one night in Fairbanks. And then we drive north to a small, that one of those communities I was telling you about earlier, a place called Wiseman. It's about a six hour drive north of Fairbanks. And it's directly under the Aurora Oval. Even if it's a KP0, that's where the Aurora is in Alaska. Then the Brooks Range, magnificent setting, and we stay there for four nights. So it's a five-night, six-day workshop. And it's very intensive landscape and Northern Lights photography because we'll mix it up depending on the conditions. If it's cloudy one night, we get to sleep in and work on landscapes the next day. If it's clear, we go out and chase the Northern Lights. So it just depends on the conditions. Okay. Um, are you comfortable with me sharing your email address and your Facebook link so that if people are interested in following you sure. or con con contacting you about this, that they can find you easy? That'd be great. And honestly, people, if you're on Facebook, do follow Carl um, because he does post some fabulous pictures. Fabulous pictures. Any other questions from anybody? Going once. Okay, I'm gonna right. stop. Can I ask one unrelated question? Sure. Carl, what is the status of the, uh, the uh, permits to get into uh, Brooks Falls these days? I know my son and I were up there about five years ago and we lucked out. We got a, got a permit that somebody else had coughed up at the last minute and got in there uh, and, and were able to spend like four days there. But I understand they've changed the the permitting application system. Well, I'm, I'm not aware of permits for Brooks Falls. That's a place you can fly into on any given day. I'm not about the camp, the campground. That's oh, the campground. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I haven't camped there a long time. I, I understand though that, I mean, there's, there's a much lower demand now compared to, you know, recent normal years. I mean, last year definitely would have been a time to go to Brooks Falls. Um, because there's so there were so few visitors here, um, but I you know I was just actually chatting with somebody about this just the other day about a permit for camping at Brooks Camp, and they were surprised at how easy it was to get one. So I would check and see what that opportunity. I just for the first I've been trying for 20 years. I just landed a McNeil River permit to go to that McNeil River State Game Sanctuary, which is another one of the brown bear viewing hotspots. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing that in mid-August. Cool. Very cool. Well, thank you again, Carl. This was wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time. And I um, really just appreciate you calling in all the way from Alaska. It well, thanks really for well. the invite. And I mean, if, thank you. if there's anything good the pandemic has shown us is it gives us the opportunity to do stuff like this and, and interact across many state lines.